All right. So um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, how to use numerical relativity as a tool for uh, cosmology and studying the early universe. Uh, the reason why I'm picking this as a topic is because uh, when I was at Penn State, my background in study was numerical relativity. And at the time, the, uh, I was told by a postdoc that the only problem in numerical relativity is colliding black holes. So we were looking at this problem of how you collide black holes on a computer and, uh, and then look at the gravitational waves that come off and use that for future detectors. And that seemed a little boring because it seems like if you've got an entire field and you've got all these people working on it and you've only got one problem to solve, what do you do when you solve that problem? So I've spent a lot of time thinking about how can you use the same tool uh, for other things? into more detail about what is numerical relativity and uh, what exactly we're studying in the early universe and all these other little things. So let me start at the beginning. And this is literally starting as close to the beginning as we can. So if you look at the universe, you look out at night, you see stars in the sky. And what you're really doing is you're looking out and you're looking very far away, and since you're looking very far away, it takes a finite amount of time for the light to get you to the some of those stars, so therefore you're actually looking back in time. And so if you get a powerful enough telescope, you can look back in history. And you can, if you look at, through the Hubble, you know, you talk about seeing the first stars ever, or the oldest galaxy, that's looking way back here in time. But what happens is you reach a point where no matter how big and powerful your telescope is, you can't see any first. And the reason why is because at that point in history, the universe was so dense and had such thick nuclei that you really could not see further back. Light just couldn't pass through. So what happens is uh, if you look at cosmology and the study of the universe, this first part up here basically represents what we know about the universe from direct uh, observation through astronomy. Everything down here describes what we know about the universe through fundamental physics. And so this is why I call it cosmology or they call it astrophysics instead of calling it astronomy. It's that astronomy is basically this part and this part is just more pure physics. And so what they've done is they've kind of broken the history of the universe up in a different era. So, this is basically where we are in the present, when we look out and we see the cosmos. Uh, back here, if you go backwards in time, it's about a billion years old. It's about uh, 13.7 billion years old right now. And about a billion years, this is when the first galaxy formed. If you go back further, when the, Earth was, uh, when the universe is about 500,000 years old, that's about as far back as you can look with the telescope. You get beyond that, you can go all the way back to three minutes when the universe is three minutes old. And at that point, you've got some really interesting particle physics and plasma physics going on. And you can go back even further, but beyond this, this era of nucleosynthesis is when the first um, solid nuclei and you can actually start getting chemistry because you're actually starting to get the nuclei of atoms forming. Before that, you just had particles floating around in a super plasma, and that's about a thousandth of a second. And then you get to the electroweak era, where the fundamental forces of the men uh, and uh, the weak force were combined into one force. And that's when that stuff that they're studying in the LHC, or the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, you go back further than that, you get to the Grand Unified Era at 10 to the minus 38 seconds after the, uh, after the universe began. And at this point, you're dealing with some really, really strange, um, really uh, theoretical physics that very few people understand. And then you go back beyond that, it's called the Planck era. And that's where you can't even use general relativity and quantum mechanics at the same time because the result is just nonsense. They don't work together, and you actually need a quantum theory of gravity to make sense there. And this is kind of what I call the God knows what happened there. <laughs> so, to look at it uh, a 
another way. Um, what happens if you look at this part in the early universe is if you look at this size here, this is basically the size of the universe, and as you can see, the size of the universe got smaller and smaller as you go backwards in time, and it got really, really tiny here and somewhere down here with just a point singularity. And somehow between this being a point and getting to here, it blew up really fast. So it's this really quickly changing era in the universe, and that's called the inflationary period. So what inflation was is that basically if you look back in the universe and you, uh, you know, there was this theory of, um, they call it Big Bang Theory, which basically said that if you look back in time, the universe should have been hotter and denser and smaller, and it should have gone back to a point. And, and um, this was a theory was developed by a scientist named uh, Lemaitre, and then the uh, it was actually proven by Hubble, which is what the Hubble uh, telescope is named after. So what happened was he Hubble looked out and he saw this universe and he saw it does get smaller as you go back, but then at the same time he was able to calculate what was the age of the universe. And what he found was, is if you go all the way back to the beginning of the universe, the universe doesn't quite start at a point. And this was kind of disturbing because it's kind of like saying it just started here and then went up. And so what they had to do, they had to kind of get the universe to go from here back down to the point. And they explained that using this thing called inflation theory. And this is a theory developed by Alan Guth in the uh, early 80s. And the basic idea was the universe underwent this inflationary period where it grew by 60 e folds, which is around 26 orders of magnitude, in a tiny fraction of a second. So if this is the age of the universe, this is when the universe is around 10 to the minus 36 seconds, down to 10 to the minus 32 seconds, it just blew up really fast. And then it continued to grow normally after that. And so this theory makes a lot of this stuff make sense, and there's a lot of evidence to support this inflation theory within the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, other astronomical observations. But the problem is, in order to make this inflation theory work, you need this thing called a scalar field. And the scalar field, you put it into fundamental physics, everything works out, and it can show how you can have a universal inflation. Um, faster than the speed of light, possibly, um, in just a really short time. The problem with the theory was then, in order to get this scalar field to create this thing called a false vacuum, um, you need to have a scalar field. And we don't know what field like what was it? Where did it come from? Where did it go? Why did it just show up right then and then disappear? So it's sort of like it makes a lot of stuff work, but then it creates new problems. And if this inflation uh, period when it went on, what happened was there were kind of, it formed this thing called a false vacuum, which is sort of like if you normally think of this room as empty, but it's really not empty because it has all this air in it. So within that false vacuum, there could be bubbles that would form and they would move along and these bubbles are bubbles of real vacuum inside of the false vacuum. And their motions would cause turbulence, they would cause gravitational waves, they cause all kind of little dynamics going on. And this dynamic might be something that we could observe later on that might be relevant. Because it's relevant to the physics of the early universe. So here's another picture of what happened. And you can see this is the early universe. This is the inflation period, and there are all these little quantum fluctuations and all this interesting physics going on. And then from here up to around 400,000 years was some, a part of the universe that we can so far only speculate what happened by inferring the physics from it. There's no electromagnetic or light waves that come directly from this we could ever directly observe. And so what happens, though, is that there were gravitational waves that came out of this. And these gravitational waves could have been something we could observe, and they could be a key to actually looking directly at the beginning of the universe. So 
that brings up the question, what are gravitational waves? What am I talking about? Um, by the way, I should make a note that a lot of these pictures here, I actually stole these from Kip Thorne from Caltech. So, and if any of you run into him, don't say a word. So, um, gravitational waves are something that showed up as part of Einstein's theory of general relativity back in 1916. And the idea was that Einstein's theory says that if you take a mass, like say a bowling ball, and you put it on a sheet or, or a mattress or something like that, it'll curve everything around it. It'll curve the sheet. And then if you take another smaller object, like say a baseball, and you put it on that, on that sheet, it will roll based on the motion of, uh, of that bigger thing. So you actually get the curvature of space-time, which is caused by having a, a mass of objects. And so this is basically what Einstein theory brings. Now the neat thing is that this is a lot like um, when you take a ship and you put it in the water. What's happening is you're displacing a lot of the water. Same way you're curving the space time here. But what happens when a ship moves through the water? You get waves. So what happens here is when you take this massive object and it's curving space time and it starts to move, then the curvature of space time is going to have to change around it. And the deformations are going to change, and that's going to cause ripples. And those ripples are going to be the gravitational waves, which we could hopefully observe. And so basically, general relativity breaks down to this. Space time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space time how to curve. And so there's an interplay back and forth between the two of them. And so these gravitational waves are actually ripples in the fabric of space-time itself. So this is what gravitational waves are. And what's happening here is you can imagine the gravitational wave is going into the screen, and you have a ring of particles. And if, if the, if the gravitational wave passes by, it causes the ring to, go, to get deformed. So it goes from being a ring, kind of an oval, back to being a ring, and then being an oval in the other direction. And so you can get two different polarizations from these gravitational waves. One is called a plus polarization, uh, which, you know, looks like a plus, and that was a cross polarization. And you can actually even combine these two together, and you can get a, um, a rotational polarization where it almost looks like this is just rotating around in a circle, and it can go to the right or left. And so this is kind of neat because this means that like when a gravitational wave passes by, you actually get a little bit taller and thinner, and then you hit the other part and you get shorter and fatter. <laughs> so this is what a gravitational wave does. It actually distorts space-time in this kind of pattern. And so what happens is when you look at gravitational waves and contrast that with the electromagnetic waves, which are light that you use to do normal astronomy with, uh, there's a lot of advantages to gravitational waves in using those in astronomy. With electromagnetic radiation um, or electromagnetic um, astronomy, they're basically oscillations of the electromagnetic field that are propagating through space time. They also are given incoherent uh, motion to any particle they hit based on their charge. So if you have a positive charged particle, it's going to go one way and negative, it's going to go the other way. And, and the more strong the charge is, the more it's going to react. So you get a lot of distortion from the electromagnetic waves because of that. They also are very high frequency. They go from one megahertz to 20 orders of magnitude. And they tend to be emitted from uh, places that are optically thin and gravity is weak. So this is like a star, um, you know, like our sun, which would be a good example of something that would emit electromagnetic rays. It's easy to see. And also, one thing unfortunate about this is that, as far as we know, uh, objects that can emit this kind of radiation make up like 1% of our universe. Or less. So we see stars. We can see uh, a little bit of uh, curvature of this light around dust or things like uh, dark objects or planets. But 
it's really hard to do a lot of physics with it because there's a lot of the universe you can't see like this. Gravitational waves, on the other hand, they're oscillations in the fabric of space time itself. And when they hit an object, all objects respond in the gravitational waves because all objects respond the exact same way to gravity. Also, um, the frequency range is much different. They start around one kilohertz and they go down 20 orders of magnitude. So these waves are actually in the same frequency range as sound waves. And there was a, uh, a presentation I saw once where I think it was Sean Carroll, he actually, or Scott Hughes, he actually did a presentation where he had gravitational waves uh, from a colliding black hole source. And instead of showing a graph on the screen of this, what the waveform would look like, he actually played it through a set of speakers. And you could hear the, the frequency changing as the collision happened. They're also uh, never significantly absorbed or scattered because they're coming from the fabric of space time. The only thing that can really scatter a gravitational wave is a black hole, space time singularity. And they are emitted by strong, uh, compact, massive objects. Basically, they're emitted by anything that's really big and moves. And so gravitational waves are a very good tool for probing the dark parts of the universe that you can't see through uh, conventional astronomy. So the sources of gravitational waves are things like binary black holes. This has been the source that's been studied the most. And it's a very strong source. We don't know how many of these things there are. But basically what it is, is two black holes that are hitting each other. So you got two very massive, compact things. They run into each other. A lot of gravitational waves are emitted. And for the early gravitational wave uh, detectors, this is what they were planning to see first, because this could be happening not far from here. By not far, I mean somewhere either in our galaxy or our local galaxy cluster. Uh, then there's binary neutron stars. This is very similar to the black hole case, but they're not as massive. And then there are other things like supernova explosions, like uh, the Crab Nebula. When a supernova explodes, not only do you see a, a burst of gravitational waves, but you also can actually see optically what's going on. And that actually provides a really interesting experiment, because then you can actually see how quickly gravitational waves propagate compared to optical uh, light. And then there are stochastic sources, which is their fancy way of saying that there's so much stuff going on, we can't distinguish everything. But what they really mean is there's sources coming from the background cosmology of the universe. And then there's all these exotic sources of things that come from just uh, theoretical physics that nobody really understands. So when they say um, some of these exotic sources, there are things like cosmic strings which we don't even know if they really exist or not, but they could have gravitational waves and um, just cracks from the fabric of space-time and other stuff that you'd see on Star Trek. So this is how you would actually detect a gravitational wave. What happens here is this is an interferometer, uh, kind of like the Michelson interferometer that they tried to use to prove or disprove the existence of an ether when Einstein around. And what it does is it's got two arms that are 90 degrees apart in this case. And you shine a laser and it gets split and it goes up each arm. And after it goes up each arm, it bounces back and forth several times and then the signal comes back through and it gets put together and it goes in a photodiode. And what happens is if nothing, the waves are in sync. However, if something going on a gravitational wave, one of these arms should get longer and the other one should get shorter and vice versa. And they should keep changing with some frequency. So you're basically just looking for a little signal of these things moving out of phase. Now for a signal, the signal they tend to use as a reference is a binary black hole collision. And for you know solar mass black hole uh, that are colliding, 
Um, they expect to see a signal that's on the order of 10 to the minus 21. That means that the delta L, the change in length divided by the total length of the arm, is 10 to the minus 21. That means if you want to see a signal on the order of a tenth of a millimeter, which shouldn't be too hard to measure, tenth of a millimeter, small, but you can see it, you need arms that are three light years long. Okay, so when they first took this to NSF, they said no. <laughs> so then they, uh, well, they said, well, what about if we want delta L equal to 10 to the minus 13 centimeters? really small. That's the diameter of an atomic nucleus. That would require arms that are 4,000 kilometers long. Anybody off the top of their head know the diameter of the Earth? But uh, you could not fit that thing on. So there was a, a no to that, too. And so then what they finally ended up settling on were arms, in this case, uh, for the uh, LIGO interferometer in the United States, that are four kilometers long. So that's four kilometers going in each direction just to this instrument. And the, what they actually end up getting with that is a delta L equal to 10 to the minus centimeters. That is one one thousandth the diameter of an atomic nucleus. And so in order to build these arms, they are uh, kept under a vacuum because you have these lasers shining, you don't want all these extra sources of noise. But they can't be cooled because if you cool, um, cool it to keep the uh, noise down, what you're actually doing is creating extra noise for the mirrors because you get condensation from the mirrors from the little few things that are in the vacuum. Then you've got other problems with the mirrors, like when you try to hang these mirrors, there's all these vibrational sources that cause the mirrors to shake. And I didn't know this until I uh, started working with people doing this, but the, uh, if you hang them from a rope, the little fibers inside of a rope make so much noise they would destroy the thing. If, uh, if somebody were to walk by the mirror, the gravitational influence of that person would be enough to throw off the thing. There's this thing called a microseismic peak that most people don't know about unless they're surfers. And what happens is every six seconds, a uh, wave hits the shore on the coast of the United States. And what happens is that shows a, a ripple effect through the entire coastal um, shelf, or through the entire continent. And that will screw up your signal as well. And so you've got all these sources of noise. You've got the laser uh, aren't perfect. They have certain amount of shot noise in them. Um, you know, you've got imperfections in the mirrors. You've got to have your suspension system. All these things have to come together and plus the electronic noise. And then, if you do get this thing to work, if it's the only one, how do you know you're even really seeing anything and it's not noise? You actually have to set up a network of these and you have to get them to communicate. So we've got um, two, actually two and a half of these in the United States. There's one where they set up two on one site, but then um, that one smaller ones are actually, I think they're going to move it to Australia or somewhere. And they've got detectors in Europe, in uh, Pisa, Italy, in uh, Germany, and Japan. And so they have to put all these things together and they have to communicate in order to see a signal, which just looks like a little wave in order to determine what they're getting. And then they have to cross-correlate between all these different sites where the signal's coming from, how far it is away, all that other stuff. And so, in short, this is why I'm not an experimentalist. <laughs> uh, and there's some guy who's in a basement somewhere in Caltech that has to keep track of all the noise that goes on with this thing. So, um, the problem with that LIGO detector is that when you get down low enough in frequency, you get to a point where you can get a signal because you just can't overcome the noise. So that, the ground-based detectors have a, a frequency range around 10 hertz to around 1,000 hertz. And a sweet spot's around 100 hertz. And so that's really good for solar mass black holes. And an interesting thing is, is that the frequency of gravitational waves that you get scales inversely with the mass of the object creating gravitational waves. But the bigger the object, the stronger the gravitational waves. So 
you're looking at solar mass black holes, they're not as big compared to some other things, and you have a limited range because they have to be within uh, basically our local galactic neighborhood to see them. And so you might set up this instrument and you could end up waiting years to see a signal. So one way around that was this, uh, LISA. And LISA actually started off as a project between NASA and the European Space Agency. What they've done is uh, NASA said, well, we don't have money for that anymore. James Webb. And um, so they, NASA bailed on it, and now it's a European Space Agency project it's called ELISA. So the neat thing about LISA is it's in space. And since it's in space, they don't have to worry about some of the noise sources. Like they don't have to worry about seismic noise. They don't have to worry about um, a lot of the other things. And also, since it's in space, there's more real estate to work with. So for LISA, uh, where with LIGO, you had arms that were on the order of four kilometers. LISA has arms on the order of five million kilometers. That's a million times larger. And what it's going to do, it's supposed to fall behind the Earth by 20 degrees, and it'll just be three satellites flying in formation, shining lasers at each other. And since it's a triangle, what it actually does is it has two interferometers, so it can check itself as far as any other frequencies. You don't need two of these flying. And also, the frequency band one is much lower. So it's tuned to detect a lower frequency gravitational wave, and the, the uh, gravitational waves in this band are mostly around the, the level of supermassive black holes, like what we find in the middle of galaxies. And so every time two galaxies collide, which astronomers say happens a lot, there should be some supermassive black holes hitting each other, and that's going to be putting out a gravitational wave signal, and we should be seeing it. And so when we look at the range of this thing in this frequency band, it basically was um, the same as the visible universe. So any gravitational wave in that frequency band anywhere in the visible universe should have been seen by these things, assuming they can get the thing ever to fly. And so it gives you an opportunity to do some interesting physics with it because you know, you're looking at some interesting sources. And so uh, I thought, well, maybe you could do some cosmology with this because you know, lower frequencies. And then a new technology came about called pulsar timing. And what pulsar timing does is you detect gravitational waves, but you can actually do it without having to build a spaceship or a big interferometer. What you do is you use pulsars for your interferometer. So you take your, uh, you look at pulsars with radio telescopes, and pulsars are incredibly regular, pulsing. And pulsar time, the pulsar signal should not be changing because they're incredibly regular and better than any clock on, on Earth. But what happens if space time were to actually expand between you and the pulsar is there should be some little delay in the signal close together. And so the idea of this is that if you're on Earth and you just set up a network of radio telescopes, and they're monitoring a lot of pulsars in a lot of different directions. And they're just keeping track of the timing for all these things. And then as soon as there's a glitch or a delay, then you can actually you know, see that, and you can know whether or not a gravitational wave passed by. And the neat thing on this is that, you know, like at this core, if you want to um, uh, be able to see a, a difference of around a tenth of a, of a millimeter, you need arms that are like three light years long. Well, these arms are bigger than three light years long, effectively. So you've got super, super long arms, and so you're looking for a bigger difference, which is an easier signal to see. And um, you can do this something that's already up there in the sky instead of having to build something, but you just have to build a network and be able to talk to these things and so on. And the frequency range of this thing is something on the order of a nanohertz, so about a billionth of a hertz. So very, very low frequency, which means low frequency, really, really massive object, and the, and the thing you would expect to see in this frequency range is actually 
gravitational waves coming from the early universe. Yes. Can you clarify, you're talking about measuring the timing of the solar signals in terms of space. But you said that they're better than any clock on Earth. So, <laughs> how, I mean. Uh, I don't know the exact precision off the top of my head, but I just know that they're, um, the regularity of the frequency. If you compare it to like atomic clock or something like that, um, that's about the standard. Get on the regularity of the pulses. Because if you think about it, these things are spinning uh, and they are not subject to a lot of resistance or anything that would change their period. Another reason is that uh, the, the spinning rate of the photons depends on the mass of the neutron mm -hmm. And the mass that we talk about is 10 million years to change. Right. Very dense. Actually, there is a way you can send the photons slowly and change the frequency of the pulsar. See, as they're plugging away, emitting energy, they're losing spin rate very slowly. So, pulsar is down, but that's on a much longer time scale than this. Well, yeah, the only time that they've actually seen pulsars where there was actually a, a more immediate change in frequency, I believe that was uh, Taylor and Hoff, 93 Nobel Prize, and that was actually used to confirm the graph exists through a second-hand nature. We actually had two um, two neutron stars, one with a pulsar, and they were in a binary orbit, and you could actually hear the pulse changing, and you could tell it was bleeding off energy, and that was the only way they could tell. They've also been used, the changes in frequency on short time scales have been used to detect pulsar planets. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? Um, yeah, the pulsars, they, that it's like super fluidity. Yeah, it's also responsible for like Yeah. Yeah, but we're And sometimes you can see that and it um it's that's still you know, you, you know more about that talking to Dr. Masood, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could but historically these are Incredibly, incredibly accurate, and like I said, you could use this for um, detecting little differences. So uh, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about numerical relativity. And so basically, what numerical relativity is the science of solving Einstein's equations using computers. And so the neat thing here is we get to drive some of the biggest supercomputers on the planet, and um, your lab is literally just the internet away, so uh, you can do really, really interesting physics from a beach. Uh, and so the, for, the focus of this numerical relativity has been on these colliding black holes uh, because they're a strong source of gravitational waves. And the entire industry in numerical relativity was focused on that for years until somebody solved the problem. And then they started saying, okay, what else are we going to do? And so they started taking these numerical relativity codes and saying, well, now we can collide with black holes and, and spiral and collision. So they started adding in uh, fluid dynamics and plasma fields into the relativity codes. And they started using those to do better simulations of neutron star collision. And they also used some of that to do uh, accretion disks around black holes and looking at the dynamics of the plasma as it fell into a black hole. And you can also use it to actually simulate what happens during the supernova explosion. So all of these things involve strong gravity and some type of fluid motion at the same time. And so basically the way the simulations work is we have the solution we start out with at times t, and then uh, we have a set of differential equations and we evolve the equations along maybe what we call the last and then flying the ship to face the coordinate system, we get a new solution at new time. And then we evolve that, and we evolve that. And so it's a lot like making a movie where it's just frame after frame after frame, moving forward in time. And uh, in order to solve different equations, and I don't, I usually don't like to put equations up, but I think you guys can handle this. So, um, we use a, kind of a differencing method because we're writing differential equations. And so we have to be able to take derivatives of 
whatever uh, the functions are. And we do that in one of three different ways. We can either use a second order finite differencing method, a fourth order finite differencing method, or a second method. And the difference is, is that these are basically using just discrete points in our solution in order to calculate our derivative. And this one, actually what it does is it actually uses Fourier transforms and inverse transforms to kind of create a more smooth analytical solution. And the basic idea is that we can get more precision with less data points, and therefore we can use that to our advantage. And so this brings up some of the problems I've identified and what you can use numerical relativity for in cosmology. Then the first problem was on doing numerical simulations of uh, Sharon Simmons inflation. Uh, this is a project I uh, started on about a year ago, and I am uh, working on this now with Chris Underwood. Uh, I'm going to, today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of what we've done with this, and then uh, I've got some really neat results, but I can't show them to you today, and Chris is going to be showing them to me in two weeks. Uh, there's another project that I worked on with the gravitational waves from uh, primordial turbulence. And the idea here is to actually look at what the gravitational wave spectrum was that came from uh, turbulent plasma in the early universe. And then these other two are projects that are kind of uh, on the wish list. One is this, uh, there was a theory I read which actually tried to explain dark matter as a result of uh, turbulent dynamics, like uh, uh, gravitational turbulence, and the only way you could actually test that out would be to actually simulate gravitational turbulence to see if you get something that would not matter. Another one was um, a theory that said that you could actually uh, explain dark energy as a back reaction of gravitational waves in the larger universe. And then finally, a few people come up with uh, modified gravity theories. Uh, it's called modified Newtonian dynamics. And the other one is a tensor vector scalar theory of gravity. And basically, what these do is starts off with something like uh, Einstein's gravity, and it's able to sort of modify general relativity. It, in, the, in a vacuum, Einstein's equations work exactly like you expect them to. But as soon as you add in a matter field, there's secondary effects which uh, uh, change the curvature in ways that you would not think from the traditional uh, general relativity. And so when you do that, you can possibly explain dark matter, but this has not really been explored much because it's so difficult to solve Einstein's equation that who knows if it's true or not. So, the possible research outcomes of this. Uh, one is to be able to simulate inflation from fundamental physics, to actually understand uh, like where the scale of field came from, where it went, why it only acted for a certain amount of time. Uh, another one is to calculate a spectrum of gravitational waves from the early universe using direct simulation, where we'll actually be able to say what you look for if the early universe looks the way we think it did, and to kind of double check the theoretical physics. We can test cosmological theories by comparing results to gravitational wave observations uh, with uh, something like pulsar timing or LISA. Uh, this will also allow us to test alternative theories of dark matter and dark energy, and possibly an alternative theory of gravity in general. Uh, we can study the interaction between uh, plasma turbulence, the magneto-hydrodynamic turbulence, and gravitational waves, because we do know that one affects the other. If you have a turbulent plasma, that should generate gravitational waves. If you have gravitational waves, they'll actually excite most of the plasma. So we actually get to see more about how that dynamic plays out. We can study the dynamics of this relativistic plasma, and uh, which has been done with non-relativistic plasmas, and they've used for studying the dynamics of the sun. They've used this to study uh, solar winds and um, interstellar environments, but inter interplanetary environments, but not at a relativistic level. And also, we can uh, study the dynamics of the turbulent gravitational field. 
which could just be interesting in itself. And so um, what I'm going to talk about is most of the chair and Simmons inflation, and then I want to talk a little bit about um, the gravitational waves from the early universe. And so the basic idea of this is that it's an attempt at explaining the origin of a scalar field as an interaction of uh, a gauge field and uh, a fermion current. A fermion current you can think of as just a flow of particles. And a gauge field is like um, a potential field, like uh, you get for electricity or magnetism. And so the basic idea here is that if you have um, a scalar field and you have, or sorry, a gauge field and you have this fermion current, the dot product of those two gives you a scalar, and that scalar could be the scalar field in your own universe. Now, I heard about this theory uh, at a friend, uh, Stefan Alexander, who developed this theory. And he gives me a call. He was in Houston and wanted to meet up. So I met up with him, and he pulls out his iPhone, and he starts showing me his paper that he wrote about this thing. And so one of the things he said was he said, you know, started explaining this theory and explaining some of the dynamics to it. And I started, in my mind, making correlations between his theory and plasma physics. And to me, it starts sounding like the same thing. And I said, well, so what's going to happen in plasma physics is that you have this thing called an inverse energy cascade, where all the energy kind of moves in the order mode. So if you have a regular turbulence in, say, water, and you stir water, most of the energy is going to go into higher order mode, which is a short wavelength mode, and the water is going to just kind of get really random and break up. With plasma, it works the opposite way. All the energy goes into lowest order mode, so you get this big, long mode. And it's just an interesting dynamics to it. So I was thinking that all the energy is going to go into these low order modes. And his response is, yeah, right. So then after a while, I think he kind of thought, okay, well, maybe he's right on this. So we started working on this project and tried to numerically simulate what happened. And so the idea was we took the system of equations that he had in his uh, paper and modeled it as a set of coupled differential equations in order to put it into a computer. And basically, we involved the gauge field and equations where the Friedman equations represent the interaction of gravity and matter according to uh, uh, the cosmological theory. So these are the evolution equations, and I promise you there's only one more slide with equations after this. <laughs> uh, and so what happened was this is what we were modeling originally, these first four equations. And we modeled this and uh, didn't quite get solutions we wanted. I was able to see that we were getting inflation and we were able to get some interesting physics out of it. But we had a problem, and I'll show you the results and you can actually see what the problem was. And so what we've done this semester is uh, we started adding on these last three equations where this is an equation that's actually evolved what's going on with the um, with the current. Instead of just assuming that the current was fixed, we assume that the current is actually dynamic and it was a obey uh, set of evolution equations. This term is uh, the theta is the churn Simmons term. Uh, actually, it's theta dot over m star, which shows up uh, right here. And that also is not a fixed thing, but we assumed it was fixed in the early simulations and it didn't really work well. And so we had to add a couple of equations to evolve what was going on with that. So we start off with a set of initial conditions, plug these into the code, and these all came from what um, Stefan believed were the correct conditions. And we just started off with the gauge field was randomly perturbed and then just let the thing flow as if it was just a turbulent plasma system. This is what happens. Uh, the universe starts off fine, doesn't really do anything, and then it starts to blow up, and and then chaos breaks loose and it just blows up. And so it's pretty nice. It seems to be predicting something like inflation here, 
except that it blows up. And it should be blowing up like this. Yeah. What are on the X and Y axis? Oh, um, the Y axis here is the scale factor of the universe. And the X axis is actually time. So it's actually the age of the universe. And so according to this, what's happening is at around 10 to the minus 36 or 38 seconds, uh, 37 seconds, the universe starts to expand with inflation and then uh, it just keeps expanding. And so we were able to show how um, inflation starts, but not how it stops. And the thing is, at first, you know, saw this and we thought it was actually worse than this at first. We just kind of move along and we just spike up. And the world, are we really seeing any physics or are we just seeing some kind of numerical instability? So I played around with it and I, um, I started adjusting the size of the numerical grid. And I started playing with different differencing methods and different time steps and basically kept the other physical parameters the same. And we found something interesting is that if the size of the numerical grid is on the order of a million units, and in this case, the units we're using here are clock units, uh, so they're just very fundamental units. If they were on the order of a million units or larger, we got this thing to move along and blow up. If we use something that was smaller than a million units, if you're like 10 and the 5th units, it would just keep moving on forever and never experience something like inflation. And so that was kind of a hint that maybe there's something physical going on here. And also, the change the resolution of the grid to or how we did it, the part where inflation was always the same. So it told us that that was a good hint that it was the same physics going on. So also I looked at, um, well, what's the Hubble parameter doing? And what happened was the Hubble parameter basically it went along, it spiked up, and then it kind of stayed constant, just like you'd expect from inflation theory, but then this thing blew up at the end, too. And so that told you something is, you know, it's on the right path, but it's not correct. But the real evidence that we were maybe on to something was when I looked at the power spectrum density. And so what happened was, this is what happened initially, you have a random spectrum. And what's happening there on the... Uh, on the x-axis, this is frequency. On the y-axis, this is actually the log of the difference. So each one of these is like an order of magnitude. So zero is right at the average value of um, the spectrum. And one means you're about an order of magnitude higher. Two means you're two orders of magnitude higher, so on. And so what happens here is and very shortly after you start the evolution, you see this huge peak at a very low frequency. And it goes from randomly distributed to having a high peak here. And this is the inverse energy cascade. It's just saying all the energy kind of went down to this low mode. And it basically stayed there throughout most of the time this thing was inflating. And then later on, when things start calming down, the energy peak sort of moved inside. And then it went haywire later. And so what this told us is we're maybe we're on the right path, but we just have a little bit more to do with the physics. And uh, what uh, Chris is going to show you is that we actually managed to solve this problem. So we're actually able to get this thing to simulate without, uh, you know, with the 26 order of magnitude increase and then turn off and let the universe evolve like it should. And we're able to do that without adding in a scalar field or anything like that. And it was just a matter of just using all the evolution equations and putting in the right constants and so on. So um, one thing, uh, what we found from this was the results are consistent using computational grids of 10 to the 6 cubed or larger. And they're independent of time step. They're independent of resolution. They're independent of differencing methods. This is not a numerical trick. This is what actually happens within uh, the physics. The exponential inflation doesn't happen if you have too small a grid, which kind of means that, uh, I interpret that to mean that for the inverse energy cascade, you have to have frequencies where the energy has to be low. If your grid's too small, and it's not big enough to contain a really 
uh, low frequencies because that's really long wavelengths. And so you reach a point where you have to have a box big enough for this thing to happen. And what that tells about the universe is that the universe had to have grown to a certain size in order to allow for those really low frequencies in order to get inflation. And then once inflation started, you get this thing to ramp up. And then later on, uh, I guess Chris can talk about the mechanism for stopping inflation, but a uh, similar thing goes on and you can actually show how to stop. And so um, the inflation time is consistently determined to be about 3 million plus time, which is around 10 to minus 37 seconds, which is roughly about where the standard theory predicts it should be. So what this is starting to look like is a viable alternative to inflation theory. And I, I said here the end of inflation is still to be determined. Uh, it's still somewhat to be determined because with our simulation, it runs, it, inflation ends, everything seems to be calming down, but then the computer stops running for a completely unrelated reason to code was you think it's running out of memory or something. So it's like the data looks great, but then, you know, the computer says, all right, I'm done. <laughs> and that is the one frustrating thing here. You have to work with computers. <laughs> now, as far as uh, the plasma turbulence, the idea here is you want to be able to simulate the early universe after the inflationary event. So this is a little bit further on in history. Uh, where the universe is populated by this turbulent plasma, uh, there's dark matter, there's magnetic fields, there's all these things are going on in the universe. We want to kind of simulate what's going on and see if we can create a good enough model for it to see what the uh, observables should be later. And so we basically have classical physics, and by classical here I mean non-quantum, not non-relativistic. So what that means is that you can actually have uh, a universe described by a relativistic plasma physics. And this all happens at some time, uh, I think before 10 to the minus uh, or 100th of a second. And we're really targeting a time around um, uh, 1 10 thousandth of a second with the start of simulation. And then all these things are just evolve forward in time, and then we just look at the evolution, and then we pull data out of that. And so this is, uh, I believe, the last time we're going to show you a bunch of ugly equations. And so this is Einstein's equation and what it looks like. And basically what Einstein's equation does is the left-hand side here describes the curvature of space-time. The right-hand side describes uh, the matter field. And so what happens is this term right here is called stress energy tensor, and it describes the mass and the magnetic fields and all the other plasma stuff. And so we have to develop a code where it's evolving the right-hand uh, side, which is all the plasma field stuff, and the left-hand side, which is Einstein's relativity, and it kind of moves back and forth between the two. And so we start off very early near the beginning of the relativistic plasma phase. Uh, a little bit earlier than that, you have this electroweak phase where we actually have to bring the weak field in. It's not really easy to do that. Uh, and at this point, the universe has a temperature of 100 billion degrees. That's what I mean by relativistic plasma. It's incredibly hot, made up of electrons, protons, neutrons, neutrinos, and photons. The mass energy density of the universe was greater than 10 to the 13 kilograms per meter cube. That's 10 trillion kilograms per cubic meter. Incredibly, incredibly dense. And then uh, even people think about the Hubble constant. You've heard of that. You think of it as a constant. It's really a parameter. And um, it actually was much higher in the distant past. So back then, the universe was expanding at this rate. 2.4 times 10 to 21 kilometers uh, per second per megaparsec. Today, the expansion rate is 72. So this has gone down a lot. And a scale factor basically relates how big the universe was then to now. And you can 
it was about 100 billion times smaller than it is today. And, and magnetic fields that existed were incredibly large on the order of a trillion gal. And so we need to have a code simulate all this stuff in order to say this is what was going on. And so um, we're going to be running a simulation that does all that. And, and when you're developing a code and supposed to do all this stuff, the first thing you do is test it, and once it passes all your tests, that's when you start running it and doing science. And so um, this uh, is what we first did as a test, the approximate analytic solution. And it came from a paper by uh, uh, Stu Shapiro at a group in University of Illinois. And what they did was they start off with uh, a plasma field, similar to what we have here, but plasma field is homogeneous, and they Linear gravitational waves into the system. And you put in these standing gravitational waves, and the gravitational waves excite modes in the plasma, and you analytically, at least semi analytically, know what the solution should be. And so you can compare what the solution should be to what it is, and then you can see what's going on. And so you, this only works when you do a very short time because this is a gravitational physics simulation, eventually what will happen is when you put all the matter in the system, it will actually cause the space time to collapse in on itself. So you have a certain amount of time to run the test and um, see what happens. So it is a simulation. I, I plotted this on a log scale. And so what this is, this is using second order finite differencing, fourth order finite differencing, and spectral differencing. And in each one of these, this is basically the solution, the numerical solution overlap each other almost perfectly. This right here is the error, the, the, um, uh, in this case, the green. And what you can see here is the error is around 1%. So we have the, the exact solution to within about 1% for second order differencing, fourth order differencing, and spectral differencing. And this is when I look at the density, the um, velocity and the magnetic field terms. So it's evolving right. The big difference between these three is that in order to get this result for second order differencing, I had to use around 200 grid points in my code. So I had to use a lot of points. I got the same level of error with fourth order differencing using 50 grid points. And for spectral methods, this is only um, 16. So what this illustrates is that you can, by using a different different advantage is you don't have to use as many data points. And so therefore you're using a, possibly a lot less memory in order to uh, get your code to run. And so it passed that test pretty well, since uh, all these errors are relatively small. Uh, next test I did was the cosmology test. And what I did here was I put in, um, cosmological solution to the universe at some early stage in the universe and I just let it fly. And I said, well, here's the Hubble parameter, here's what the Hubble parameter should have been, here's what the scale factor should have been, here's the density of the plasma, the temperature of it, everything. And I just let it go. And what happened was, uh, it was really complicated, but I basically looked at the analytic versus numerical solution and I, I was able to calculate what the numerical solution should have been using the other variables. And this is the real part that matters here is the error. This is basically the numerical solution divided, minus the analytic solution divided by the uh, numerical solution averaged among all the different variables for, with um, time, temperature, energy density, Hubble parameter, and scalar field. And what happened was in each of these cases, I got something that was order, on the order of a tenth of a percent error. So this looks pretty good. And you can see that I evolved this thing from uh, when the universe was one uh, tenth to minus six seconds old, uh, a millionth of a second old, to when the universe was 86 seconds old. So I'm covering a lot of cosmological history, probably a lot more than we need to cover, just something like that. 
And then finally, uh, the test we perform is called the shock test. And the idea is you have a field and you, and you create these things called shocks, or you actually have, uh, for example, the collision test, where we take the plasma, it's uniform density everywhere, but the, uh, you put a barrier in the middle, and the plasma on one side, let's say the right side, is going to the left at half the speed of light. And the uh, stuff on the left is going to the right at half the speed of light, at some high relative speed, and they crash in between. And they crash, and your code is supposed to be able to handle this. And these are meant to simulate the sort of shock conditions that you see in a, um, if you're using this to say simulate a um, supernova explosion. And so this was basically the last test we needed to pass, and it didn't do too good. What happened is um, it didn't crash, but these results look very cartoonish. Not quite, you know, like things like this shouldn't be in here. You can see with the collision, it doesn't look too bad, but what's happening is there's all these extra things that are going on in here. So this means the code needs a little bit of work. And what we did was we used a technique called artificial viscosity to help handle the shock. And what this revealed is that that technique isn't enough. And we're uh, actually have a graduate student who's working on his master's thesis. He's adding a, a technique called high resolution shock capture to this. And so when we do that, then um, we'll be able to say that this thing can handle shock as well. And then uh, the next thing we're going to do is once we have a code and we're sure it's working, the next thing we're going to do is to uh, actually test whether our code um, can actually reproduce the results of nominal with the turbo. And so the idea here is that we know pretty well um, from work John Shevlin about what the dynamics of a non-relativistic turbulent system should look like. And so what we want to do is if we take the energy level of our code and crank it down from relativistic to non-relativistic, we should be able to reproduce the same results. So that's uh, what Fu's working on. And uh, we're going to add in the high resolution shock capturing uh, as part of uh, a master's degree thesis, and that will get us through the shock test. We're continuously improving on this churn Simmons simulation. We might actually have a result. We just have to be able to run it out further and actually see that you know, we are getting what we think that we get and that there's no big surprises later on. And then what we can do with this code is uh, we have two versions of the code. One is a fixed background where it's not changing the background to space time. And the other one is a uh, dynamic background. We can have gravitational waves and things like that. So the idea here is that we want to run this code with a, pla or a turbulent relativistic plasma on a fixed space-time background where it is um, given a sort of a simulated expansion as if it's expanding um, with the early universe. And we want to see from that what are going to be the frequencies or, or spectrum of gravitational waves that we produce. And we can get the spectrum of gravitational waves it produces by just studying the stress energy tensor of the plasma field, which we get as an output. And then we can also um, add gravitational waves into the system, and then we can look at the dynamics of the gravitational waves interacting with the plasma. And so these are some of the things that are coming up next. So I guess that's it. Uh, and I ask if you have any questions. Um, are there any advantages maybe decreasing the amount of All right, well, for which one? For the, the last one, you said that y'all are more content. Yeah, yeah um, you're talking about for, uh, for this or for the turn finish? Yeah, for the, for the turn Okay, yeah, for the turn finish, we actually um, had, I had to invent sort of a way of, um, taking uh, into account the time steps of this. And uh, let me go back and I'll, I'll show you. With this, one thing I did was uh, normally in a numerical code, what happens is you set the time step based on the resolution of the grid. So the more grid points you have, the more time steps you have. 
and uh, the, the further between grid points is the further time step. And so what I had to do with this was I had to invent a way that the system gets bigger and uh, let's say the Hubble parameter gets large or the scale, uh, scale factor gets large, it can actually um, make the time step smaller in order to kind of avoid the blow up. But in this case, the blow up still happens. Uh, we applied that to the new, um, uh, the modified code where we actually got the thing to work. And uh, we're able to fit the right parameters where it actually doesn't blow up like this, but that still causes, requires a little bit of modification of the time step. And what the time step modification we used was based on the Hubble parameter, and it basically said that the bigger the Hubble parameter, which basically defines how quickly the scale factor is increasing, the smaller the time step. So, therefore, when you're getting close to the edge, you slow down. You don't want to keep going at the same speed. And then, if it gets a larger increase in the Hubble parameter, it's going to be even slower. But then, at the same time, when the Hubble parameter decreases, we don't want to take a long time between time steps, or we'll never get to anything interesting. And the neat thing is, like, these are. Um, Simulations are running uh, on a supercomputer, but we still, uh, we only have like a week's worth of time at most to run those simulations. Any other questions? So, it's a, I guess, the grid you're using, is just a special? Yeah, basically, the grid just looks like this. Yeah, it's, just it's, it's just in space, and what happens is you got this solution is, is the solution at one time, and then you, you basically have a new grid for the next time. Just thinking of maybe a grid that's actually linked with the time step as far as the space like and time like components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that? and the, the problem with that is, is that um, you have to be able to, um, you don't know what the solution is going to be in the future. And, uh, and when you're solving um, these types of differential equations, these are hyperbolic differential equations, and you really, in order to solve them, you, uh, you basically need to know what's the first time derivative of that solution. And then what happens is that you would say that your solution, say F, uh, at time T plus delta T, is equal to F at time T plus delta T times the time derivative of that with respect to T. And so that's kind of a really overly simplified way of looking at it. You need to kind of know what that is in order to evolve the thing forward. Yes? David, what do you expect to happen when you G2 approaches Sagittarius H stuff? G2 is a dust cloud that, that might go into or go past the black hole at the center of the galaxy next year or some time. Can your simulations uh, tell us anything about what happens after people observe uh, any other radiation emitted? Uh, should the dust cloud get close enough? Yeah. yeah, and actually there are people working on that. Yeah. And that, that actually, um, what you would actually do is that's a case where um, most people just use a fixed space time background and simulate the black hole itself, which is not that <laughs> difficult. But then you would introduce, in that case, you, um, you could have a charged black hole or you could have uh, other straight magnetic fields, and you can see what dynamics comes from that. You get that charged black hole? Yeah, there's actually a... Uh, charges in a black hole? Yeah, that's what some people think there might be. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to tell, so there's just not enough information about it. But um, there are, um, are ideas that, you know, black holes could be charged, they could have magnetic fields, they could have um, some of these things to them. And it's really not completely known because you know people have gone back and forth over the no-hair theorem of black holes, and 
Well, yeah, and, yeah. and it's mostly like, uh, you know, that's a better conversation yeah, than yeah, Stephen Hawking. Well, electric affects them, electron away, mm -hmm. positively charged nuclei with the uh, black hole accumulate a positive charge. Uh, that's, that's the theory. Some people think that could happen. That you could, uh, and actually, um, it's called the, um, the Newman solution to the black hole. Because what happened is that there's, there's several fundamental solutions to black holes. Uh, there's the Schwarzschild solution, which is a very simple black hole that's not moving. It's just sitting there, nothing interesting happening. Then there's a the Kerr solution, which is a spinning black hole. And then there's a the Newman solution, which is the, uh, um, which is a charged black hole. And you can get some really interesting dynamics from that. And then there's actually a spinning charged black hole solution that they have too. And so we don't really know, um, you know, if such a thing exists because nobody actually goes there and comes back to tell us about it. But it's possible. And so when you do that, you can actually do a numerical simulation though, and you can actually simulate um, maybe a charged black hole uh, and interacting with this dust cloud. And then you can see what happens. But one thing I can tell you about a Newman solution is that uh, unlike a Schwarzschild solution, which you normally think of as a black hole solution, where it's a one-way trip, you get some solutions like a Newman solution where there's actually a possibility to come out somewhere. Which, you know, it's really odd, but it works. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. And like I said before, uh, next week is going to be our final regular talk of the semester. And um, we are going to have, I can't get his name right. Um, Chris Olson, who's a PhD candidate, uh, he's going to be talking about the Basimir rocket engine. And then the following week on the 25th is when we're going to have student presentations. So uh, students, uh, undergraduate students and uh, graduate students, please email me the title of your presentation uh, within this next week. Thank <laughs> you.